Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Space Warfighter Talks. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. And I am honored to have with me today Colonel Kyle Puma Pumroy, the commander of Delta 11. Sir, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Hippie. I'm happy to be here. And, sir, just so the audience understands who you are, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your career and how you ended up as the Dell 11 commander? Yeah, I'm Commander of uh, Space, For Space Forces Delta 11. We're the Space Range and Space Aggressors Delta. We provide all the range capacities and aggressor capacities for the Space Force and our mission partners. So I ended up here, uh, started off my space career in electronic warfare uh, at the Force Space Control Squadron, deployed a few times out of there, uh, had some uh, good downrange experience. Uh, and that played well then for squadron commander with the 527 space aggressors, which is also an electronic warfare unit. So I had the background there. It was at the time, our only range and aggressor units were for electronic warfare. Uh, I followed the, that assignment with some uh, Pentagon tours and a tour at the Combined Space Operations Center, where it's also tied to command and control for electronic warfare and then the gamut of space capabilities. And then when the Space Force identified a need to stand up a delta for range and aggressors and stand up new squadrons for orbital warfare range and orbital warfare aggressors. My aggressor experience probably played into make, making me a, 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 a fair choice to stand up the Delta as we stand up those uh, uh, new units and capabilities. Thank you, sir. Yes, that is a perfect career, I would suspect, for commanding Del 11, being the first commander of, of Delta 11. And you mentioned that within the Delta, you've got a, a couple of different organizations. Can you talk a little bit about each of those? Yeah, so right now, five squadrons, uh, and our mission sets are uh, orbital warfare and electronic warfare. So, um, as I mentioned, range and aggressors, so we have an orbital warfare range squadron that just stood up this summer. That's the 98th Space Range Squadron. They provide uh, capacities to do test and training on orbit with our what we call our min viable product orbital warfare range, which is a collection of uh, sensors uh, and um, uh, data servers uh, and visualization tools so that we can uh, keep maintain um, essentially a, a persistent look on assets uh, at GEO so that we know whether they're performing properly under test, performing properly under training, uh, and can make decisions whether to continue with tests or continue with training. Um, uh, also on the Orbital Warfare side, we have the 57th Space Aggressor Squadron, which is our new Orbital Warfare Aggressor Squadron. So they're responsible for playing the adversary in exercises like space flag and weapon school exercises, focused on co-orbital threats and direct ascent threats to our guardians. Right now, that's fully virtual. We do that in a number of um, virtual environments, uh, but we are looking to see at one point perhaps having satellites that either our aggressor assets or aggressors buy time on to represent threats for, again, test or training opportunities that our, our guardians need, but done in a safe and secure way on the 98th Space Range Squadron's uh, range capacities. Um, on the electronic warfare side, we have the 25th Space Range Squadron, which has been around since, uh, I believe, 2004. They provide environments to do uh, EW training uh, for our uh, electronic warfare units uh, in Space Force, as well as our other services that come to work on the range where we can put live bandwidth out to do energy on energy training. They also have some virtual capabilities that we can plug into and do higher end uh, training and test on. And then we have the 527th Space Aggressor Squadron, which is the, our electronic warfare aggressors, which will do everything from uh, GPS interference to satellite communications interference, training with both uh, guardians who operate satellite communication uh, capabilities all the way to um, remotely piloted aircraft flyers and showing them the vulnerabilities and how to mitigate those vulnerabilities in training. And then lastly, we have our 11 Delta Operational Support Squadron or the DOS, and that essentially does all the kind of staff functions and the like on the Air Force side, your OSS functions uh, for the Delta. And so they have a, a, a synchronization and integration uh, mission set um, within that squadron to ensure that we're integrated across uh, orbital warfare, electronic warfare. Uh, they're bringing on a scheduling capability as the range requirements begin to increase with our customer base uh, and all your standard staff functions. 
that is quite a list of responsibilities in the organization. And what's unique, it seems, is that you represent a large set of mission areas in one delta that is typically strewn across many deltas within SPOC. And so can you talk a little bit about that? You know, in the past, we've had the opportunity to talk with Colonel Beard about force packaging and the importance of force packaging. Can you talk a little bit about how you prepare um, operators and guardians to either one force package or learn lessons from some of their force packaging designs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, as you mentioned, in, um, on the Spock side, on the Space Operations Command side, we, we, we specialize in missile warning uh, or orbital warfare or uh, cyber in specific deltas. But in Delta 11, we, we have multiple missions to include cyber or orbital warfare uh, and electronic uh, warfare. So that drives the ability to integrate those things in from a, a range perspective so we can uh, synchronize uh, different uh, disciplines uh, and range capacities to allow for force package solutions to be tested and trained on. Uh, and similarly, we can bring in um, uh, multi-access uh, aggressors into training scenarios and have OW aggressors and EW aggressors fight blue, just like we would expect the Chinese or Russians to do. So uh, I like to think that within this Delta, because we have all those capacities in one command that we can be the thought leaders uh, for multidiscipline integration. Uh, so as on the Spock side, they might specialize. On our side, we're forced to integrate and allowed to integrate because we have such close proximity between our squadrons, although we have different specialties. Uh, uh, within the DOS and with me, I can, I can drive the integration that supports force package solution ideas and, and how we test them out and how we train them uh, in the future. Thank you. No, that's really important, especially when you consider the cyber component. So is that something also that's represented in your Delta is intelligence and cyberspace? Because there's been a lot of discussion from leaders, including General Whiting at Space Operations Command, about the importance of understanding cyber vulnerabilities. So is that something you look at as well? It is, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> we've actually started up our cyber aggressor mission underneath the 527 Space Aggressor Squadron. So we don't have a, a squadron dedicated to it, but we do have a flight uh, dedicated to it right now. And we're building out um, the training uh, for those aggressors. They did their first event, uh, which is a, a really kind of basic event uh, during a space lag exercise this past spring. And it was um, very successful and our training audience learned a lot. And we're scaling that uh, for a future space flag exercise where we bring that in and have a representative environment of a space network and our aggressors will come in and, and uh, try to shut it down or have impacts on it. And we'll put defenders on that network trying to keep the aggressors out of there. And so we're doing that now. Um, we're looking to scale that mission up. Uh, we expect to have more billets uh, given to us in FY24 uh, to round out that capacity. And at the same time, uh, through Starcom, we're acquiring um, uh, range, cyber range capacities as well. And so within the next uh, year to two years, we'll have our own cyber enclaves that we can put our own um, emulations of space networks on that have a dedicated uh, range capacity that we can include in space flag exercises, red flag exercises, you name it, that's focused on the guardian and defending networks uh, and allow the aggressors to go in and, and find vulnerabilities against our guardians and, and hone those skills. And so, yeah, we're, we're, we're really integrated across uh, cyber, OW, EW right now, uh, but we're at the initial stages, right? These are a handful of people starting up these missions, um, but we have more builds coming in the future and more investments coming in the future. Uh, and we're, we're focused on making it as real as possible uh, for the Guardian for the Space Warfighter. Thank you. You talked a lot about Space Flag and Red Flag, or at least mentioned it. From your perspective, could you just provide an overview for our audience about the differences between Red Flag and what Space Flag is? Right. Yeah, so Red Flag is, you know, an Air Force-owned uh, exercise that looks to bring in uh, many different uh, aircraft to accomplish, again, force package, objectives, um, 
the, the training needs and advanced training needs that our Air Forces need before they go into their combat cycle uh, so that they're familiar with the most relevant tactics and threats that they're going to see before they uh, are ready to engage in, in an adversary. And, uh, the Air Force has been doing red flags since uh, 1975 uh, and is a big contributor to the success the Air Force has had uh, over the almost past 50 years. And so um, a few years ago, we looked to start up a space flag that was really emulated off the lessons learned from red flag where we too bring our, our, our domain focused force package fighting against uh, uh, realistic threats uh, and thinking adversaries to, to hone the skills, uh, to build readiness in our, in our space forces, and to learn uh, how best to fight against uh, certain threats uh, from our adversaries. And so as you, for those that have done red flags before, uh, that's mostly or often you know, flown live uh, on the Nevada test and training range uh, with real aircraft, with uh, uh, real electronic attack and all those elements right now, space flag is done virtually uh, in a simulated environment, um, but we keep looking to get the most we can out of that environment and the most realism as we can get and still maintain that distance between red and blue uh, so that we have a thinking adversary that's trying to defeat blue and, the, and uh, blue fails and, and we learn from it and identify new ways to uh, implement countermeasures against realistic threats. Fail fast Fail as fast. the... Story goes, Story as the saying goes. The uh, you talked about the Nevada Test and Training Range. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're developing out there in uh, creating a training range environment? Yeah. Yeah. As we uh, stood up a space force and, and then investing in uh, space capabilities, we need now that space is not a, a benign environment. Identified. We have to figure out whether or not those systems we invest in work, and we have to. We need credibility in those in those systems, right? Uh, right now, the Nevada Test and Training Range on the test side, that's how you know weapon systems are credible, because you fly them out uh, on a range, you collect the data, and you identify if they met the objectives. We've never had that for space besides on the electronic warfare side to a degree. Similarly, on the then on the um, combat preparation side, the credibility that goes into the warfighter comes from their experience on the range where they have a realistic combat uh, engagement, as we mentioned, like in Red Flag. And so, again, we never had that for space. A major deficiency of space is going to be a warfighting envi environment, and we know it is. And so the Space Force has invested in building out the what we call the National Space Test and Training Complex, which will be a collection of range capacities that allow us to do tests on systems and collect data where we didn't have capability before, and then ultimately to do realistic combat training, uh, both live and virtually, so we can identify where the weaknesses is in our force uh, and focus on those weaknesses. Uh, and then we are essentially make readiness real so that when we say that our combat forces are ready in the Space Force, we, we can trace that back to threats and the experience they had uh, so that we know that they're, they're credibility is real or their, yeah, their credibility uh, it, it is real and the readiness is real. Uh, and so uh, we're in the initial stages of building that out uh, under the NSTTC, uh, the National Space Test and Training Complex, building out four elements to that, an orbital warfare element, the electronic warfare element, the cyber element, and the digital element. And all of those then will be packaged uh, into one uh, big range complex that Delta 11 will be responsible for on the um, as the owner operator for those uh, capabilities. That's great to hear. And from a TTP perspective, is this something that this range that's going to be created, is this a place where folks can go and develop tactics, uh, techniques and procedures or TTPs for their respective systems? And how important is that to the overall fight? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's in a lot of ways where kind of uh, you know, the seam between test and training is that TTP development, and it's two-way. That, uh, right, we have a, a credible capability, the warfighter knows how to operate it, but is there more you can get out of that system, or is there new information based on threats that help redefine how you operate that system? 
And absolutely, when we identify those needs uh, for uh, TTP development or refining tactics or seeing or testing if a, a, tastic, a tactic will be successful um, as it's um, been uh, uh, formulated, then a range, the, our ranges will become the proving ground that you can take uh, the threat, uh, take the capability and see if you're, the hypothesis is true. Uh, to, to see if that tactic is uh, appropriate and works. Uh, and then that feedback then goes back into um, you know, our, our uh, what we call our tactics development program, and then all the way to our doctrine program, which the Space Force has also uh, set up under STARCOM so that we can capture those lessons. That, that's great to hear. Can you talk about, and in, in, I know General Saltzman has been talking about this for a while since he was a COO and now he's the CSO, has been talking about the the need for advanced training, realistic advanced training environment for guardians. Can you talk about a vignette that would it be an example of something that you would be providing a training venue for in either a space flag or, or other situation? What I perceive uh, in the next maybe one to three years is an ability to have um, a threat surrogate uh, on orbit that's not going to do any threatening, but it might have the uh, dimensions uh, and the orbitology of something on orbit that we're concerned about. At the same time, we'll have range capacities that can watch a certain volume of space and see how uh, things work out. And then we'll have uh, an asset uh, on orbit that needs to take defensive actions. Uh, and perhaps it's a service retain capability that has fuel on it that we can do real defensive actions, right? And so we can run through a scenario where we do an approach in a safe way. Uh, we can identify when our sensors see that that threat's coming uh, so that we have you know, a non-witting training audience. Uh, and then that can feed a command control enterprise to make decisions on how we're going to uh, defend against that threat and perhaps maneuver out of the way and what type of maneuver we'll do and see if the timeline support a defense against that threat. Then we'll be able to capture all that data, be able to play it back and see what happened. Much like for those who have done red flags before you do a high speed playback of the event, we would be able to do the same and watch in real time as, as decisions were made, as actions were made. And we can learn if we think we were successful in how we um, defended against a threat or if uh, you know, we fail. And if we failed, identify why did we fail? Our command and control process is too slow. Uh, our capabilities just not defendable, uh, you know, as, what is it we can do to be more cognizant of that threat and better respond to that threat? Uh, so I think that's something we'll see in the in the near term uh, with our aggressors and our range. And then you layer in everything else we have into that, right? You, you can throw an electronic warfare fight in that scenario on top of it. You can throw cyber on top of electronic warfare on top of that orbital warfare fight. Uh, and so in theory, you could do that all live. Now, I don't know that we will or won't, but there's a lot of decisions we got to make if we can do that in a safe, secure way and in a way that doesn't you know, give the impression that we're trying to start a fight in space, right? Because this is really about understanding what's happening uh, and being able to make decisions. And so the other side of that is the digital enterprise. And as we build out the digital enterprise for our range, for those things that we think are maybe overly or too provocative or we're not confident in the safety and security, then we'll have a realistic digital environment where we can do the same thing inside. Uh, and that we have confidence in the models, we have confidence in our threat models, we have confidence in our blue models, we have confidence that all the physics are uh, purely representative of what would happen in the space environment, and then we can learn from that way as well. And so we'll have the live side and the virtual side within the, the digital aspect of the range as opportunities uh, for whatever scenario it is we need to play out. Um, but on, on our end, we want to be imaginative and see what we can do live, because that's where the most learning comes from and then default over to uh, virtual when it's just not supportable to do in a live environment. And so you bring up a good point. Uh, nobody wants a war that starts or extends into space. Just to be very clear, nobody wants that. It's not good for anybody. At the same time, like you said, you're helping to prepare the generation of space warfighters that will have to defend that domain to ensure freedom of action in that domain. As the... Uh, as the commander of Dell 11 responsible for advanced training, how do those lessons learned actually flow back into a process so that you can fix those 
perceived problems in the future and don't have those in the future. Yeah, I think that gets on a really close relationship that uh, we'll have and uh, continue to develop with Delta 10, our doctrine and wargaming Delta, that as we, you know, we will provide the environments uh, for the events. And so events will, might be put on by Delta 1, our training Delta, we might put on an event if it's smaller scale, uh, but it, particularly if we're looking to learn from the event, then we, that's when we want to pull in our, uh, our Delta 10 partners uh, that are going to have a responsibility for both concept development and doctrine so that we can feed lessons, we can feed what we're learning uh, into the doctrine enterprise, um, but then not just so funnel it solely to them and stovepipe it and then that we find a way that our immediate results, our immediate findings are shared with our training audience, shared with ourselves, shared with Starcom, shared over to Spock. Uh, and so the, the ways and the means in which we're doing that, I think Delta 10 is uh, working through of how we uh, can better share that information and data. Uh, but we're, we're always looking for that coming out of an event to say what was some major things that are we identified that our training audience learned and what's our best way to make sure that that information uh, gets promulgated across the force. Uh, and, and so that I think that just goes to the synchronization across Starcom that we've got to do that when we have the events, and then a realistic environment with a thinking adversary that the learning then is captured immediately on the, the doctrine side within Starcom. Sir, that's a large task that you've got in your organization. Do you have, or in an ideal world, um, do you have all the resources necessary to accomplish it? And I suspect it's a throughput issue, meaning it's uh, probably the more, resources, the more resources you have, uh, probably the more exercises you can uh, facilitate. So uh, at this point, what are your current numbers, if you can share them, and do you expect to grow those numbers in the future? Yeah. Right now, uh, when you look at our workforce to include uh, contractor uh, support, we're right, or, right around about 180. Uh, but even with um, billets allocated, um, and that, that's actually before FY23. We have a number of new billets coming in now that were in, um, through October, none of which we've hired against, obviously. Um, so new billets coming in FY23 and 24, as well as additional contractor support. So we expect to grow to somewhere in the mid 400s uh, over the next three years, at least billet wise. Um, but across the Space Force, obviously we have um, more billets than people as we try to bill out the force. So, we expect uh, by FY24, somewhere around 450, maybe a little bit more of that, more than that. Uh, and maybe with contractors, we could reach close to 500 um, authorizations to include contractors. But reality, I think will be, you know, 100 or so less than that, just from billets we're not able to fill because of the size of the force. Uh, but then I think over time, especially you get, you know, within eight to 10 years from now, as the force uh, grows, then those billets will, will get closer to be filled and we'll do in more with the mission. Uh, so from a manpower side, you know, we have uh, some some squadrons that are, you know, just a dozen people, but they know they're getting, you know, a dozen more people this this coming year and a dozen more after that. So they're building from the ground up these capabilities. So what do we have today? Uh, not a whole lot, but we have the resources that we expect to come and we're funded and the the big part of the mission for our new units right now is just to pave the way for the next generation of their squadron to operate uh, and scale what they've started uh, within their first one or, or two years of existence. Thank you. You talked about uh, basically operational checkout prior to deployment or their operational tour for the air domain. In the space domain, is that is there going to be the same type of requirement uh, levied upon guardians in Space Operations Command to go through advanced training prior to conducting their uh, warfighting mission? Yeah, I, I absolutely see that coming. Uh, I think it's in development now. The Space Force has moved to a force generation model where there's meant to be a cycle to where you're committed uh, as a presented force to US Spacecom or perhaps another combat command. And then you, through, after your commit phase, you roll back in and you go into a readiness building phase. And so uh, as the dust settles is trying to implement that model, 
I'm certain that we'll have uh, spin up requirements that apply to forces in what we call the ready phase uh, before they go into commit. And I think that's where we're going to start focusing almost all of our energy on the advanced training requirements that take a non committed force and declare it as being ready. Uh, and, and because in order to really declare that you're ready, you have to see realistic combat um, situations and scenarios. And that's going to have to happen on a range and it's going to have to have it's going to have to happen with a thinking adversary. And so uh, I, I think we're trying to implement it now. I think it's uh, obviously a big shift for the Space Force and it'll take time. But I certainly think in the next year we're going to start figuring out how we synchronize with the uh, force generation cycles of uh, Spox units so that we're ready to provide them the range and aggressor capacities they need uh, before they put forces into the commit phase. Uh, so I think we will be uh, very uh, directly tied uh, to SPOC uh, in their readiness building model. It's so important what you're doing in terms of so, ensuring, ensuring the operators have a realistic environment to, to train on, to get ready for conducting their, their defined space superiority mission. Um, so thanks for doing that. And uh, I tell you, I, I don't know how uh, many exercises you're gonna have to go through in the future. And if the numbers that you currently have can ensure that those forces are prepared, uh, but I know you're the right person for the job, sir. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience uh, about the important mission of Delta Letter? Well, I, I, I hit on the kind of multi disciplines uh, that we do within this Delta where we have a cyber mission, we have an EW mission and OW mission. But uh, really, when you look at range and you look at, uh, at aggressors, what, what I see is we are not uh, an operations delta, and we're not an intelligence delta, and we're not a cyber delta, we're, we're all those things, because we have to operationalize intelligence, right? I could see someone doing my job could be an intelligence professional, they could be an operations professional, and they could be a cyber professional, because uh, we can't just rely on being operators, because we have to represent what we see the adversaries do. So there's a big tie to intelligence there. And so I think uh, I would highlight that what's unique about this Delta is that we have a, a, a big mix of intelligence, cyber, space operations professionals and engineers under one hat, uh, you know, synchronizing and integrating together to where you, some of that um, you know, career intelligence or career space ops starts to um, diminish a little bit and you start kind of incorporating the intelligence mindset and vice versa because we work so tightly together. And I, I think that's critical if we're going to provide those realistic environments and thinking adversaries that we have to have, you know, have to be unique in that way that uh, we have to open our horizons, be intellectually curious, uh, and not just think of ourselves as space operators or cyber professionals uh, or OW professionals that we, we have a specialty but we have to be curious about all those other things so that we're uh, keen on integrating them together uh, because we know our adversaries will, and we know the domain uh, is, is integrated. And so we become that, that, like I said, the thought leaders for integration, but we're also the ones that kind of blend the experience and the mindset of an intelligence professional or a cyber professional and operations uh, professional that we kind of throw that aside and just say, hey, we're all, here we think of ourselves as radicals, right? We think of Delta 11 radicals because no one's ever fought a war in space and we've got to envision it, create the environments for it and create the, the aggressors for it. And that requires radical thinking, uh, to do radical things that no one's thought to do before, even in what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. Um, and so you kind of shed your background and adopt that kind of mindset uh, in this Delta and figuring out what's the best way we can make blue better. And that's what we're all about. Sir, sure, copy that. Cross-career integration uh, is really what helps define Delta 11. Colonel so, Homer, I th thanks for talking about that. Real quick, um, uh, how, how can industry help out? Because I know they're chomping at the bit to help you out to make sure you have the capabilities you need. Yeah. Yeah, so on the NSTTC side, uh, as I mentioned, we're not carving out space uh, on orbit for a range. It's really about the, the ability to maintain uh, constant uh, or persistent observation of a, 
of a portion of space, collect that data, fuse that data, condition that data, and bring it to a display to make decisions. And so I think from an industry standpoint is we're really interested in sensors, uh, optics, radars that can refine our understanding and drive down uh, the error uh, that we that we uh, would, would have in terms of what we're looking at um, and have more confidence in that data. Um, and then kind of expanding the horizons beyond, okay, so we're interested in where objects are in placement to each other. But again, how do we collect data in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum? How do we collect data in terms of uh, any other uh, kind of emissions we're concerned about on orbit? And then again, condition that into and have an understanding of what's happening on orbit so that we learn, right? And so I think from an industry standpoint, that's where I would see a lot of the focus going is uh, it increase our ability to understand, uh, maintain awareness, uh, maintain persistence, and drive down the error um, in those data so that's as, as perfect as we can possibly get. And that's through a the, the first, from what I understand, the first integrated program office? Right. And so uh, <clears throat> Starcom, in a partnership with Space Systems Command, uh, has set up its first integrated program office where we have professionals from both field comms uh, working the acquisition strategies and the acquisition process for our range capacities and our aggressor capacities. Uh, and it's so far been uh, really successful in terms of their ability to move fast, in terms of their agility, uh, it, and uh, it's probably forming a great model for the rest of the Space Force to follow, in my opinion. Um, but they'll be, they're the ones that are working uh, to, to be clear on what our needs are, what we're building to, kind of establishing the roadmap for the, the types and capabilities of sensors and um, the ways in, in terms we're going to collect data and understand data. Uh, and then they will work with industry to figure out how we fill those needs and fill those requirements. Um, and then we, we just become the voice of the operator back to the integrated program office or the IPO to make sure that what we're going after seems executable on our end uh, and that arranged controllers and aggressors can you know, operate con in consist uh, consistently with uh, what the IPO is looking to uh, acquire and build uh, for our, our range. Colonel Pomeroy, I know there's a potential for people who are excited about what's happening in the private sector and potentially want to leave the Space Force. What do you tell kids to keep them really energized about this important mission that you're doing there at Delta 11? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And it's something that our folks come to me often about to where what they see is there's opportunities on the outside and there's no way that the Space Force can be able to match the pay that some of uh, these companies and industry are, are paying right now. Uh, <clears throat> but I think where there is opportunity there and what we really drive after is, you know, for a lot of people and when you're serving, it's off, it shouldn't be about the money, right? It should be about service. You want to serve the nation. Now, uh, you might be enticed by money when, it's, uh, when you're not enjoying your experience and there's opportunities outside. Uh, but the one thing that's unique about military experience is either, um, you know, seeing combat for real, which hopefully we never have to do in space, but having realistic combat experiences that you're never going to have an industry, right? You're, no one working for SpaceX uh, launching is going to say, oh, I, I really enjoyed having that uh, realistic fight with this adversary. But in the Space Force, if we do it right, we'll have range environments and a force generation model that brings guardians into a realistic combat scenario where ultimately, if they do their job right, they succeed. And feeling like you just beat an adversary that was trying to kill you in space uh, and knowing that uh, you survived and you beat them, I think that's worth more than money to somebody who wants to serve their nation and know that they have that confidence that if China or Russia comes after them, they're ready and they can defeat that. And I think if we can build routine experiences where you have realistic combat experience, where you're, that that stress, right, that anxiety of if I lose, I'm gonna this this would be uh, losing for real if I lose in this environment. Uh, and if you lose, then you learn from it. And then if you win, you get that exhilaration from knowing you can defeat the enemy and doing that over and over again. I think that if we can build that experience in for the Guardian and have you know, 
routine combat-like experiences of what uh, fighting will look like uh, in space and through space. I think that would be a great um, way to ret retain talent because you keep all the people that are less interested about the pay and more interested in defeating China or Russia. I think where we're gonna have trouble is if our guardians don't have those experiences, then yes, their experience isn't gonna be that much different than what they get in industry. So of course you're just gonna go after the bigger paycheck. Um, but we, I think that's what the Space Force is looking to do uh, with our advanced training models, our fourth generation models. And, uh, and if we continue to do that, I think that will be, we'll, return, we'll retain the right talent uh, in that scenario of the people that wanna serve, wanna learn how to fight and wanna uh, credibly uh, protect the nation. Sir, that's a great Sir. point about uh, retention and providing those experiences that they can only experience as a DOD military service member. Sure, thanks so much again for your time today and what you're doing there leading Delta 11. And I look forward to talking with you as this mission continues to evolve and develop. On behalf of the entire Space Force Association, sir, uh, thank you for your service and have a great Space Force day. Semper Super. You too, thanks, Zippy. See you. See you.